Section 39 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Young Naturalist. There are other armies in South Africa besides the Boers and the British. Armies of very little folk which go out on foraging expeditions when their colonies stand in need of supplies, forays planned and executed with military precision, and, as a general thing, uniformly successful. I speak of an army of ants. A close observer residing in South Africa describes one of these forays in the following way. The army, which I estimated to number about 15,000 ants, started from their home in the mud walls of a hut and marched in the direction of a small mound of fresh earth, but a few yards distant. The head of the column halted on reaching the foot of the mound and waited for the rest of the force to arrive at the place of operations, which evidently was to be the mound of fresh earth. When the remainder had arrived and halted, so that the entire army was assembled, a number of ants detached themselves from the main body and began to ascend to the top of the mound while the others began moving so as to encircle the base of the mound very soon a number from the detachment which had ascended the mound or lilliputian copy evidently the attacking party entered the loose earth and speedily returned each bearing a cricket or a young grasshopper dead which he deposited upon the ground and then returned for a fresh load. Those who had remained on the outside of the mound took up the crickets and grasshoppers as they were brought out and bore them down to the base of the hill, returning at once for fresh victims. Soon the contents of the mound seemed to be exhausted, and then the whole force returned home, each ant carrying his burden of food for the community. My very young readers will be surprised, no doubt, to hear me speak of wasps as cement makers or paper makers, but such in truth they are. You can form no idea of the industry and toil these little folk expend upon the structure they call home. Nothing pleases them better than to find an old fence rail covered with a light grey fuzz of woody fibre loosened from decaying wood by excessive soaking of rain. Dozens of these little pulp gatherers will descend upon the rail and as fast as each of them obtains a load, away he flies to the place where the home building is already going on. This may be in a clump of bushes near a stream, and as fast as they deposit their load of fiber down, they fly to the stream and having secured a mouthful of water, Back they go to the nest to beat the fibre into a thin sheet, which they deftly join to the main body, the jointure being imperceptible. Such a throng of workers coming and going, some to the fence, some to the nest, some to the brook, each addition to the structure being the tiniest mite, yet growing perceptibly under the united efforts of the little builders tar one of the commonest substances met with in city or town is tar a paper roof covered with tar makes a very good protection against sun and rain provided a suitable amount of gravel covers the tar the kind of tar most used is called coal tar or gas tar this is made at the gas factory from the distilling of soft coal Tar that comes from different varieties of pine and spruce is used to cover ropes and hulls of ships. It is from his having some of it usually clinging to his hands and clothes that the sailor boy came to be called Jack Tar, and from his fondness for the sea one of the royal family of England got the pet name of Royal Tarry Breeks. It is strange that there has been no change in the work of getting this kind of tar from the wood for over 2300 years. 
the wood is placed in holes dug in the ground and covered carefully with turf so as to keep out the air and prevent too much burning some of the wood is left free so the air may get at it and burn it enough to make heat enough to distill the pitch from the rest of it this is gathered into barrels and is black because of the smoke that gets into it it was this sort of tar that benjamin franklin had his experience with one time in philadelphia he was running along on the tops of tar barrels on the wharf one fine day with his sunday clothes on the head of one barrel was not in good condition and so benjamin went down into it the next issue of his paper had a very amusing account of the accident in which franklin used his powers to make puns to great advantage in making fun at his own expense ants would you like to get a clean skeleton of any small animal place the body near or upon an ant hill and the little workers will clean it off for you perfectly picking every bone as clean as if they were under contract with a forfeit for every scrap of flesh skin or sinew left upon any bone they like meat so well that they will attack animals that are many times larger than themselves and carry the work to a successful end there are three kinds of ants in an ant hill males females and neuters the males and females have wings and do not work to speak of they are always waited upon very carefully by the neuters who have no wings but are noted for their industry skill and strength it has been said that the ant stores up large quantities of grain in the summer for winter use whoever said that was not well acquainted with his subject in winter the ants neither eat nor work some of the neuters have their jaws or mandibles made much larger than the rest these are the soldiers and they fight with greater fierceness than any other creatures huber the blind naturalist who told the world so many astonishing things about bees describes a great fight he once saw between two colonies of these little warriors Quote, i shall not say what lighted up discord between these two republics the one as populous as the other the two armies met midway between their respective residences their serried columns reached from the field of battle to the nest and were two feet in width the field of battle which extended over a space of two or three square feet was strewn with dead bodies and wounded it was also covered with venom and exhaled a penetrating odor the struggle began between two ants which locked themselves together with their mandibles while they raised themselves upon their legs they quickly grasped each other so tightly that they rolled one over the other in the dust when night came they stopped fighting but the next morning they went at it again and piled the ground with slain and wounded End quote. their stings hurt because they carry a liquid that is like that found in nettles and in the hairs and other parts of certain caterpillars this is called formic acid and is made by chemists for certain purposes the red ant dislikes to work if he can get slaves to do it for him perhaps we should say if she can get it done for her because these neuters are rather more like females than like male ants they make war purposely to get into the homes of other colonies to carry away their eggs and baby ants they bring these up to wait upon them when they go on a journey the slaves have to carry their owners and sometimes they even feed them until they refuse to feed themselves they have been known to die of hunger with plenty of food within easy reach but with no slave at hand to place it before them on going out to fight for the offspring of other ants they go in regular columns 
and those that are left after the slaughter return home in the same order their solid train sometimes extending more than a hundred feet some ants keep cows plant lice have honeydew in their bodies and when well fed they give out a great deal of it ants are fond of it they sometimes confine the plant lice feed them and milk the honeydew from the bodies of their captors a german scientist named simon has recently returned from australia with some great stories about ants he says he suffered much from their attacks in trying to get rid of them in many ways he at last hit upon the idea of spreading a poison where they would have to pass across it he used prussiate of potash which is sometimes used in photography another name for it is cyanide of potassium he says quote, how astonished was i when i saw the whole surface of the heap strewn with dead ants like a battlefield the piece of cyanide however had totally disappeared more than one half of the community had met death in this desperate struggle but still the death-defying courage of the heroic little creatures had succeeded in removing the fatal poison the touch of which must have been just as disagreeable to them as it was dangerous recklessly neglecting their own safety they had carried it off little by little covering every step with a corpse once removed from the heap the poison had been well covered with leaves and pieces of wood and thus prevented from doing further damage the heroism of these insects which far surpasses what any other creature including even man has ever shown in the way of self-sacrifice and loyalty had made such an impression on me that i gave up my campaign and henceforth i bore with many an outrage from my neighbors rather than destroy the valiant beings whose courage i had not been able to crush End quote. in the extreme southwest of the united states are colonies of ants that have a peculiar custom of setting apart some of their number to give up their lives for their fellows in a strange way they feed upon honey until they are unable to walk then their fellows take the greatest care of them and feed them so their bodies are distended enormously a number of these ants when fed so highly look very much like a bunch of little grapes they are so round and translucent when food is scarce later the other ants come to their heavy mates and eat them with great relish air the wear and tear in our bodies is replaced by new material carried to the spot by the blood the heart forces the blood out along the arteries in a bright red current it comes back blackened with the refuse material it passes to the lungs where it comes into contact with the air we breathe it does not quite touch the air but is acted upon by the air through very thin partitions much as the cash business is carried on in some houses and banks with the cashiers all placed behind screens where they may be seen and talked to but not reached purified in the lungs by contact with fresh air the blood goes back to continue the good work of making the body sound but if the air has been used before by someone in breathing it has become bad and the blood does not get the benefit from contact with it in the lungs that nature intended ordinarily a man breathes in about four thousand gallons of air in a day if he is taking things easily but when he is hard at mental or physical work he needs much more than this air that has been hurt by being breathed is restored to the right condition by the leaves of trees and plants in large cities where people are crowded together there is a lack of good air 
but nature is continually rushing the air about so that new may take the place of what has been used rain washes it out and the storm brings in from the country just the kind of air the city man needs in his lungs end of section thirty nine Section 40 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900, recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Bird Life in India In India, bird life abounds everywhere, absolutely unmolested, and the birds are as tame as the fowls in a poultry yard. Ring doves, minas, hoopoes, jays, and parrots hardly trouble themselves to hop out of the way of the heavy bull carts and every wayside pond and lake is alive with ducks geese pelicans and flamingos and waders of every size and sort from dainty beauties the size of pigeons up to the great unwieldy cranes and adjutants five feet high end of section forty this recording is in the public domain section forty one of birds in all nature volume seven number four april nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org ireland's lost glory there is perhaps no feature of irish scenery more characteristic and depressing than the almost universal absence of those tracts of woods which in other countries soften the outlines of hills and valleys the traveller gazing on its bald mountains and treeless glens can hardly believe that ireland was at one time covered from shore to shore with magnificent forests one of the ancient names of the country was the isle of woods and so numerous are its place names derived from the growth of woods shrubs groves oaks etc that as dr joyce says if a wood were now to spring up in every place bearing a name of this kind of the country would become clothed with an almost uninterrupted succession of forests on the tops of the barest hills and buried in the deepest bogs are to be found the roots stems and other remains of these ancient woods mostly of oak and pine some of the bogs being literally full of stems the splinters of which burn like matches the destruction of these woods is of comparatively recent date cambrensis who accompanied henry the second into ireland in the twelfth century notices the enormous quantities of woods everywhere existing but their extirpation soon began with a gradual rise of english supremacy in the land the object in view being mainly to increase the amount of arable land to deprive the natives of shelter to provide fuel and to open out the country for military purposes so anxious were the new landlords to destroy the forests that many old leases contained clauses coercing tenants to use no other fuel many old trees were cut down and sold for twelve cents on a single estate in kerry after the revolution of sixteen eighty eight trees were cut down of the value of a hundred thousand dollars a paper laid before the irish houses of parliament describes the immense quantity of timber that in the last years of the seventeenth century was shipped from ports in ulster and how the great woods in that province two hundred ninety thousand trees in all were almost destroyed the houses passed as an act for the planting of two hundred and fifty thousand trees but it was of no avail and so denuded of timber had the country become the large work started in elizabeth's reign for the smelting of iron were obliged to be stopped at least for want of charcoal the present century has continued the deplorable story of destruction in forty years from eighteen forty one to eighteen eighty one forty five thousand acres of timber were cut down and sold every landlord cut down scarcely any one planted so that at the present day there is hardly an eightieth part of ireland's surface under timber end of ireland's lost glory end of section forty one this recording is in the public domain recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america Section 42 of Birds in All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. 
Recorded for LibriVox.org Birds and Reptiles Related Fossil remains have been found of birds with teeth and long bony tails, and also of reptiles with wings, great monsters they must have been, veritable flying dragons. In 1861, in the lithographic slates of Solenhofen, Bavaria, a fossil feather was found, which was the subject of considerable discussion among naturalists. Again, in 1862, a curious skeleton was disinterred from the same place, in which most of the bones exhibited the marks of a true bird, but the skeleton had a most remarkable tail containing twenty distinct bones. From each of these bones proceeded a pair of well-developed feathers, similar to the single feather which had been previously found. Here was an animal which could be called a bird-like reptile, or a lizard-like bird, with equal propriety. Its twenty caudal segments, or vertebrae, were a bar to its entrance to every existing family of birds, while it was equally out of place among reptiles. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Birds in All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rock Shells Frank Collins Baker, Curator of the Chicago Academy of Sciences The rock shells, or murices, are among the most beautiful and interesting of all the mollusks, or shellfish, and are a favorite among collectors. Their peculiar spiny shells and brilliant colors cause them to be among the first mollusks studied by naturalists and we find them, therefore, described in the earliest works on natural history. There are about 200 different kinds of rock shells, mostly confined to the tropical and subtropical seas, although a few are found in temperate climes. The greatest number of these are found about rocks at low water, but not a few are inhabitants of waters as deep as 50 fathoms or more. In our own country, they are abundant along the coast of Panama, the Gulf of California, Florida, and the islands of the West Indies, but the largest number of varieties comes from the Indian Ocean, Japan, the Philippines, and Australia. The more brightly colored varieties are from tropical seas, while the dull, plain species are from subtropical or temperate climes. The murices are peculiar in having their shells ornamented by numerous projections, which vary from long, needle-like spines to simple fluted frills. What these spines and frills are for would probably puzzle the ordinary observer, as they would seem at first sight to be in the way. In some cases they are simply ornamental, but in the main they are protective and enable the animal to escape being eaten by some voracious fish. This is known as protective adaptation, and was probably brought about in this manner. The murices, or their ancestors, did not at first have spiny shells, and they fell an easy prey to the fishes. As time went on, a few individuals, through some modification of environment, developed small spines, or prominences. The animals having these were not eaten by fishes, as the knobs and spines caused the fishes pain when swallowed. Therefore, they preferred the animals with smoother shells. In time, this modification caused a weeding out process, the animals with smoother shells being exterminated, and those with spiny shells increasing in numbers and becoming more spiny as one generation succeeded another. This continued until the present time, and is going on even now. Another interesting fact concerning the development of this ornamentation is that the smoother shells inhabit rocky shores, where the waves are constantly beating in with greater or lesser violence, 
while the more spiny individuals live in protected and comparatively still water. This adds additional weight to the theory expressed in the last paragraph, for the fish which feed upon these shells do not, as a rule, inhabit localities where the water is rough, as along a rocky shore, but live abundantly in protected bays and lagoons in which the spiny murices are found. There are shown on the plate eight species of rock shells, all more or less common. The first one for us to consider may be called Venus comb, Murex tribulus, and is found in China, Japan, and the Indian Ocean. It belongs to a group of shells which is characterized by a long snout or canal and long pointed spines. The color is yellowish. In one variety, the spines are tipped with black. A shell which is found on the mantle in every household is known as the branched rock shell, Murex ramosus, which is widely distributed, being found in the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, New Zealand, Australia, and the Central Pacific Ocean, and attains a large size, some specimens reaching the length of a foot and weighing several pounds. The aperture is frequently tinged with a deep, beautiful pink. In many households, the large shells of this species are used for flower pots, suspended from a hook over the window by a set of chains, and for this purpose they are certainly very ornamental. The apple murex, murex pomum, is of home production, being found on the shores of Florida and throughout the West Indies. It is not as attractive as the shells just mentioned, but is very common, every collector possessing several specimens in his cabinet. In the aperture of this species will be noticed a dark brown object, which is known as an operculum or door, and its use is to close the aperture when the animal withdraws into its shell, so that the latter may be safe from its enemies. All of the rock shells possess this organ, which is attached to the back part of the animal's foot. A peculiar and somewhat rare shell is the horned murex, Murex axicornis, found in the Indian archipelago, whose shell is made up of many curiously fluted spines. The burnt murex, Murex adustus, is an inhabitant of the Indian Ocean, Japan, and the Philippines, and its name, which signifies burned, is well chosen, for all its spines and frills, and most of the shell are black in color, and look just as though the shell had been scorched. The aperture is often beautifully tinged with pink or dark red. A common rock shell found in the Mediterranean Sea, as well as on the Atlantic coast of France and Portugal and the Canary Islands, is the purple murex, murex trunculus. This is a light brown, three-branded shell, about two inches in length, and is famous as having been used by the ancients to obtain their beautiful and rich purple dye. On the Tyrian shore, these shells were pounded in cauldron-shaped holes in the rocks, and the animals were taken out and squeezed for the dye which they secrete. If the animal of one of our common purpurus, a small shell found along the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, be squeezed, it will exude a purple fluid, which will stain fabrics a reddish purple. It is probable that much or most of the royal purple of the ancients was obtained from these lowly creatures. Although the most beautiful shells of this family are supposed to live in the warm, tropical seas of the Indian Ocean, it is nevertheless true that many of the most brightly colored rock shells live in the warm waters of Panama and Mazatlan. The root murex, murex radix, is one of these shells which attains a length of five inches and weighs several pounds. The shell is white or yellowish white, and the spines and frills are jet black, the two colors producing a peculiar effect. Another beautiful shell from the same locality, Panama, is the two-colored murex, murex bicolor, a shell attaining somewhat larger dimensions than the last. The spines are reduced to mere knobs in this species. There are but a few frills, and only two colors, the shell being greenish-white, and the aperture a deep red or pink, plainly showing whence the name bicolor, two-colored. This shell is collected by thousands of Panama, 
and shipped all over the United States to curiosity stores at summer watering places and other vacation resorts, where they are sold at from a few cents to a dollar each, according to quality. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Spring has come. Would you think it? Spring has come. Winter's paid his passage home. Packed his ice box. Gone halfway to the Arctic Pole, they say. End of Section 44. This recording is in the public domain. End of Birds in All Nature, Volume 7, Number 4, April 1900.